Everybody is just crazy about corn toads. They're just so squatty and fierce. I think it's this combination of they're really tough, but they're actually not. <laughs> kind of so ugly that everybody loves them, you know? It's amazing how people, how they talk about them. This cowboy, tough guy, you know, they are cursing, and at the end they leave and they're like, please keep working with those little guys, we need them. And it's like everyone, it's like that. They don't bite, they don't squirm, they don't run away very quickly, so it's easy to catch them and actually hold them. All their anti-predator behaviors are fast. Fascinating. Uh, the blood squirting, you know, they'll puff themselves up. Uh, I've never, nope, never had them squirt blood on me, but I have seen it happen. You know, one of the questions we get asked by landowners, you know, all the time is, what happened to horned lizards? Can they ever come back? Can we ever bring them back? So it's obviously a kind of a complicated answer because it's not just one thing. It's, it's the, probably the primary reason I think we all feel confident it's just habitat loss. You throw in things like fire ants, you think uh, loss of harvester ants, people poison those for years, and that's, you know, horned lizard's primary food source. That they're kind of a diet specialist. So um, all those things interwoven, you know, have led to their decline. You know, it, it's, it's, it's a handy umbrella species. And they, they inhabit mostly grassland areas where we have a lot of species of concern. If the horned lizard goes away, that means there's something wrong with the environment that we need to take so they're very valuable in that respect. When you're working with a system like this, you get, it's important to keep all the parts. We may not know what all of them do, but we know they were all in there when it was working the way it was supposed to. Originally, I was approached uh, by a person from Texas Parks and Wildlife and asked if I might be interested uh, in working on the genetics of horn lizards in the state of Texas because uh, TPW was at that time strongly considering uh, reintroducing uh, horn lizards into areas where they had disappeared. It was not known uh, beforehand how this species was structured in Texas. And in order to do reintroductions, in order to have captive breeding programs, one of the first pieces of information that you need to have is a good understanding of how a species is structured in its natural environment. Horn lizards have disappeared in many parts of Texas. We work on a small town that still have very high uh, numbers. So we want to see how this trend is going over time. So identifying unique individuals, we can monitor their numbers. Zoos are using that information and they're going to concentrate on different areas. So the Fort Worth Zoo is going to breed lizards uh, from the northern area and the San Antonio Zoo is going to breed lizards from the southern area. There is no manual to tell us exactly how to do this because nobody's done it before really and been, and been successful at it. And then those lizards, uh, you know, with the help of Texas Parks and Wildlife, are going to be reintroduced into areas where they match. I think a major way that, that universities like TCU uh, can help with conservation efforts is that we can provide kind of very detailed expertise in certain areas that may not be present in uh, other organizations that are working uh, to conserve uh, animals. It's hard to have an appreciation for those sorts of things if you haven't sort of interacted with it firsthand in some way. So I think there would be opportunities for us here at TCU to appreciate the natural history of our mascot I think is one step in sort of educating them about sort of the natural world around them and why we should value um, these resources and protect them. Humans getting to interact with wildlife, like for me, that was a huge game changer, like getting to hold a horned lizard in my hands. You know, I grew up in the city where there's not a lot of animals, where I didn't have a really strong connection with nature, and that completely changed my outlook on the role of humanity in this planet. I think that we owe it to ourselves and our students to really try to help them understand how global biodiversity loss and bringing animals into close proximity with humans is contributing to pandemics like COVID-19 and this jumping of these of viruses from wild, wild populations into human populations. I think research of my colleagues and my peers and the students here at TCU, it contributes to the greater good at a, at a level just by generating new knowledge and this idea of we don't have all the answers yet and so if you pose an interesting question and then you figure out a way to try to answer it, you then have an answer. But often what we get from that answer is more questions. To, to have a place where my kids can go see something wild with all the growth of you know human expansion population, which is inevitable and nothing wrong with that, but you still have some wild places where they can go you know, 
see a horny toad, see a deer, is, is something that's important to me. I want to pass that on to them. As long as, as we can get a connection between people and wild places and wildlife, I think we'll be okay.